Andrew Huberman's latest video is truly a gem for those looking to bolster their cognitive capabilities. As a professor of neurobiology and ophthalmology at Stanford School of Medicine, Huberman's authority and expertise really shine through his articulate and deep-rooted discussion. He covers an impressive range of topics related to focus and concentration, from ADHD and sleep behavior to more unconventional techniques like binaural beats and the role of nutritional supplements. Absolutely. Stress and anxiety. Look, whether or not you get into a cold ice bath or a, or a hot sauna so hot you want to get out, or you get hit square in the face with something over text that you really didn't want to hear or see, it's adrenaline. It's just adrenaline. This expansive scope allows listeners to grasp the intricate tapestry of factors that contribute to focus and concentration. He doesn't just brush over the subjects, but he actually delves into them with a depth that both enlightens and intrigues. Yeah, I think we're dealing with two general categories of people who have problems with motivation and focus. And I think we've failed to decide, um, excuse me, I think we failed to describe the fact that there are two groups and not one. We think, well, I need to calm myself enough to move forward. I think, and then other people say, well, no, you need to kind of ramp yourself up to move forward. Here's what, the way I conceptualize it based on the data that I'm aware of. Some people are just hypo aroused. They're just not motivated enough. And those people would benefit greatly from cultivating practices like super oxygenated breathing. Mm -hmm. So this is something along the lines of like tumo type breathing. So rapid, and we look at this in the lab, we're actually running a human study on this now. So 25 or 30 deep breaths through the nose and out through the mouth, then exhaling the breath and holding, learning to how to self-generate adrenaline. Grounded in neurobiology, his explanations provide a robust scientific basis for his advice, serving to enhance listeners' comprehension and confidence in the strategies discussed. This episode doesn't disappoint. It's a, it's a testament to Huberman's ability to make complex scientific concepts accessible to a broader audience. Now, the nervous system is always measuring both to some degree or another. One might be more of our focus than the other. If we see something really dramatic, like if I go and I've, I've seen one of your shows before I met you, I went. Oh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah, that's right. I was at your New Year's Eve show, I think it was in Portland a few years back. And so I was fully in the experience of, I was in full exteroception, but when I would laugh, I'd feel something. So it's kind of going back and forth, interoception, mm. exteroception. Sounds when, exhausting. No, it was Sorry. actually a lot of fun. <laughs> it was actually a lot of fun. Um, the, and we're doing it all the time, right? Except when we're in sleep and then we're fully in our, we're only in relation to what's going on inside us What if you sleep. have night terrors like me? Uh, it's still only in re relation to what's going on inside you. So you're only interocepting. But when people meditate, you're increasing that interoceptive awareness. And for people that are anxious, mm -hmm. that may have social anxiety, to gain more awareness of how you're feeling inside mm -hmm. might actually be going in the wrong direction. Because mm. if somebody who has social anxiety goes to a party where they have speaking public speaking anxiety, mm. they don't want to be thinking about what they're feeling. They want to be out of their head, yeah. out of their body a little bit. Now, you don't want to be so out of your body that you're not in touch with your body. That's right. So there's a balance there. And I think certain forms of meditation actually have led to um, some uncomfortable states for people where they can't get out of their head because mm -hmm. they've spent hours sitting there thinking That's about right. their own thoughts. That's right. This video serves as an excellent example of how science can be seamlessly integrated into our everyday lives. Huberman shines in his ability to explain complex neurological processes in very, very understandable and engaging ways. The reason I encourage people to get sunlight in their eyes, especially early in the day, is that it helps wake you up. It improves your mood, improves hormone output, improves focus. It's good for so many aspects of but biology. But how do I do and it, it helps you, hurting and my And it helps eyes. you sleep at night. Okay, so what you want to do, people have different levels of sensitivity. You want to look in the general direction of the sun. Okay. If it's low in the sky, it's no problem. You could literally look at it like this. Now, the higher it gets in the sky, the more imposing it is, and you'll want to close your eyes. If it if it forces you to blink, you need to look away from it a little bit. Indirect light is fine on a real really clear day. Yeah. Um, if it's if it's very, very bright and you need to blink, blink. I'd say take your sunglasses off for doing this. Eyeglasses and contacts are fine. And after, you know, two, three minutes, you're good. Mm -hmm. And if you're walking to work in the morning, it's a nice sunny morning, but the sun, you know, is New York, so a lot of the sun is blocked by these big buildings. You just get the indirect sunlight. And that's okay yeah, too? That's okay. But through a window, these tinted windows that are everywhere here or through a windshield, it's not going to happen. Yeah. It's just never going to set this 
this mechanism uh, in the ways you need. So if you, you know, watching a sunset, you can literally watch it. Yeah. Right? Isla Vista, we used to watch sunsets, right? Yeah. We had to disappear off Del Playa with the oil rigs out there. And every, for the people who don't know, there are these oil platforms that sit off the beach in Santa Barbara and they, it seeps up all this tar. Mm. Um, but it's very beautiful sunsets out there and you can look directly at it when the sun is low yeah. in the sky. Um, when the sun is overhead is t when it tends to be really bright. Don't stare at it directly. And what is the advantage of this? It just wakes you up or something besides so, that? So you have neurons, nerve cells in your eye that connect, that when that sunlight hits them, they send a signal to your brain that's a wake-up signal. Gotcha. Improves your mood, increases testosterone, it um, increases metabolism, it lets you focus better, and it sets a timer so that you can fall asleep fall asleep at night about 12 to 16 hours later. If you're oh, not getting light in your eyes, and if you wake up and you're just on your phone, that's fine if the sun isn't out, but if you're on your phone for the first two hours a day and then you get outside and get sunlight and the sun's already overhead, and you're, you go out with your sunglasses on, that kind of thing, you're, you're gonna find it's very hard to fall asleep that night. He demonstrates how simple lifestyle practices like cold exposure and SDR and yoga nidra can influence our cognitive abilities, our, our productivity, and overall quality of life. His articulation of the scientific mechanisms underlying these practices helps to mystify them and reinforces their potential benefits. Um, and there are different categories of people out there, and I want to be respectful of the fact that not everyone's trying to, you know, build and create. But I would say if you're a creator, if you if you want to build something, business or write or music or sport or anything, I'll tell you, I know, I'm fortunate to know a good number of very successful people if you're a creator, you're, you have to always ask yourself, are you playing offense? Are you playing defense? Or are you just bench warming? And most of the activities on the phone, not all of them, are in the defense or bench warming category. If you're a content creator, you want to be a content creator, you absolutely have to take the effort to create space in order to produce content. And that's going to require agitation and loneliness and frustration for brief periods of time. I'm not saying about for years of your life. I mean, for five, 10 minutes while you're not tending to the voices and the things that need you. And yeah, they need you and they will have anxiety and you will have yours. And, but people, if you're going to produce content, you need that to create that space. The other thing is that the, the phone is wonderful, right? You can turn on a reverie hypnosis script and, you know, just cause it's there and you can use it. So I, I want to acknowledge its utility. It's a wonderful tool, but the other, the other thing is that young people have integrated the phone into their nervous system in their lives in ways that other people haven't. So I would say that for people that are listening to this now in 2021 and they are 20 years or younger, chances are the phone isn't going to feel as intrusive as it will for somebody who's older than that. Just because of the way that when the nervous system wires up, like I had a 14 year old niece and the phone is just wired into her relationships. So if you take away her phone, she suffers in a way that maybe doesn't justify taking away the phone. So this is going to be an interesting kind of generational conversation. But if you have a hard time not turning off your phone for an hour to do focused work or 90 minutes, if that's a real challenge, that's a great invitation to start working through some of the neural circuits for what we call no-go. So I do this now, I, I'm revealing all my little weird uh, quirks, but they're grounded in neuroscience. So um, we have circuits that are called go circuits. These are, if you wanna know that, if you wanna look them up, they're circuits of the basal ganglia. And they're involved in any time we make a decision to make a behavior like reach out, I just picked up the bottle, put it down deliberately. And then we have no-go circuits. These are ones that suppress behavior and they've done a lot of beautiful experiments where you can create a, uh, a video game or something where people have the impulse to make a choice in order to score points in a certain amount of time. And sometimes you have to go and sometimes you have to no go. You have to avoid movement and suppressing movement takes effort. 